Calimera and welcome to Stupid Ancient History, Stupid A-Level Greeks. And today, particularly, we're going to look at the impact of the Ionian Revolt in the changing relationships between Darius and the rest of Greece. So previously on Stupid Ancient History, we spent a bit of time looking at the Ionian Revolt. This was, of course, the failed attempt by Aristagoras of Miletus to expand his influence led to a failed revolt and unfortunately for him provoked the entire Persian war machine to come along and defeat him, destroy him and generally do bad things. Although this didn't work out terribly for most of the Ionian Greeks, Miletus was of course sacked. The big problem this brought though, however, is that the involvement of Athens and Eretria have now particularly focused Darius's mind on Greece and particularly on Athens. These are now clearly in his sights and represent the next step for his expansion. We can obviously suggest this is clearly motivated by revenge because as we saw in Herodotus we're continually told that he has to remember the Athenians. So the first step Darius takes in terms of remembering the Athenians and doing something about Greece is that he puts one of his relatives, a guy called Mardonius, someone we'll come across quite a bit later on, puts Mardonius in charge of a new army and a new navy, and they're given the distinct mission to go and sort out the Greeks to punish Athens. Now Mardonius, it seems, takes a bit of an unusual route for this. He, tend, he decides to, rather than heading straight to Athens, he decides to cross the Hellespont, this bit of water at the north of um, Greece and the Ionian states. Now this makes sense militarily. He's got a huge force, hundreds of thousands of men, and what he doesn't want to do is risk losing any of them unnecessarily. So the Hellespont represents the shortest possible crossing of any body of water to get to Greece. So in this way he knows he's not going to lose any men to things like sinking ships. Geographically, though, if we look at the map, this is possibly less sensible. Because if we're saying the eye of his mission is Athens, if that is the goal, if we look, he's got to travel pretty much through the entirety of Greece, if not all of northern Greece, to get there. So it's certainly kind of a bit of a scenic route, which then leads us to kind of question the motives for this and this idea of revenge against Athens being possibly too simplistic. Certainly Darius is not happy with Athens and this could be the catalyst or the cause of why he does what he does next. So punishing Athens is one thing, but given the route Mardonius takes and everyone he's going to have to go through to get there, we can probably suggest that this um, would be a prime opportunity while he's punishing Athens to expand the Persian Empire right throughout northern Greece, if not all of Greece. We should point out as well that at this point, places like Thrace, some of the states in and around Thrace and Macedonia are already kind of open to Persian rule. The Persians certainly have some influence in northern Greece, in places like Thrace, partly because of their proximity to the Persian Empire and the Ionian states, but also because, as we said early on, they feel somewhat snubbed by the southern Greeks who simply regard them as not properly Greek, as wild tribes and almost kind of land to be colonised. So around about 492, Mardonius gathers his invasion force and as we said before, he sets off across the Hellespont with his army and navy heading further into Greek territory. Now we should point out that it's important that he takes an army and a navy. The terrain throughout northern Greece, in fact all of Greece, is quite difficult to move across with such a large army. Similarly, by bringing a navy as well, it allows them certainly more flexibility in terms of how they move troops. If there's an obstacle in front of them, they can simply sail around them. The army would probably tack the coast following the navy as well. Equally, if some city-states prefer, well, want to put up a naval defence, they are equally able to do this. So the army and navy working together 
is quite a common thing for the Persians to do in terms of tackling Greece. They're taking everything they possibly need to go and get the job done. So army and navy head off across the Hellespont with no real issues that we're told of and they head deep into Thrace until, if we look on the map, as his navy are sailing around the Athos Peninsula, this sticky out little bit of land, um, they are hit by what Herodotus describes as a terrible storm and the ships that aren't smashed against the rocks and the people who aren't killed in this way, they are eaten by sea monsters. Uh, take what you will from that, this is probably Herodotus being slightly elaborate with some of the truth. It's, I don't think he's actually suggesting that Kraken comes from the sea and eats them all, but certainly kind of larger aquatic predators, sharks, squids, that kind of thing. Either way, this is a proper disaster for Mardonius because he feels without his naval support, without that possibility of naval supply lines and that extra body of men, the campaign he set off on is not going to do very well. Certainly when he gets to more of the kind of coastal naval towns, it's not going to go well. So this is pretty much a disaster for him. And such is the damage to his naval force, they are effectively forced to turn back round again. So Athens is not punished, the empire is not really expanded, and it's a fair guess to say that Darius would not be too chuffed if Mardonius simply rocked up back in Susa, back in the Persian court, saying, sorry mate, all my ships have been killed by sea monsters. Now, either through fear of what Darius will do to him if he goes back empty-handed, or through opportunism, he's there at the time, why not? Or wanting to do something to make his name great, Mardonius pushes on, he continues his campaign without proper naval support. Now, this is a bit of a disaster in some respects because as he marches further along the coast, his men are continually attacked by hostile local tribes, either Thracians not willing to submit to Persian rule or some of these raiding northern tribes that these Greek states have had to deal with almost consistently. So as he goes along, he loses men, they're continually under attack. It's not easy going, it's certainly not a walkover. But as he moves further in, it's not a disaster because he does get a large number of Thracian leaders, enough Thracian leaders to submit to Persian rule so the Persians can officially claim Thrace. But it seems this is not enough for Mardonius. He's determined to go back with something else, given that Thrace was already sort of subjugated to Persia. So he presses on to Macedonia. As his men reach Macedonia and they continue the march, um, we get this unusual situation where the king of Macedonia, a guy called Alexander, not the great one, um, they greet the Persians reasonably positively. They accommodate Mardonius and effectively they again submit to Persian rule. Um, I'm not saying this is a straightforward, hi, how are you doing? Let's just join you. There's reasons why they probably submit. Um, Macedonia at this time is in a bit of crisis. Certainly Macedonian kings have a habit of dying either in battle or being assassinated. And they are again continually dealing with raids from these northern tribes. So the backing or the aid of a major state like Persia would probably be very useful to them. They're probably thinking, what's the worst that can happen? They're relatively close geographically and it's likely any further Persian incursion into Greece will come through Macedonia, so it would be silly to resist that much. But also, I mean, as we've said before, there's no real love lost between Macedon and the southern Greeks. They have a, at best, distant relationship. So the Persian coming is not necessarily a huge threat to these northern Greek states. And again, round about the same time, um, the Greek island of Thassos uh, is brought under Persian control. They sort of, see, again, they see some benefit after a short standoff with the Persians, they see a benefit of joining the empire. Now, Thassos would be a very, very powerful ally to the Persians, or member state. 
um, they are a very wealthy island. They are also quite important navally. They stick out into this northern Aegean, they can effectively control a lot of the trade and the waterways in this area, particularly again they are not far from the Hellespont and as well as being this short narrow gap to cross from one side to the other, the Hellespont is the main trade route into the Black Sea and the city-states and settlements further north. So it's really kind of key for trade. So Thassos being a naval power, they've spent a lot of time building ships with some of their wealth. They've become a very, very valuable part of the Persian Empire. So Thassos, really important. So by this point then we see Thrace, Thassos and Macedonia all subjugated into the Persian Empire which effectively puts a clear divide through Greece, the kind of north siding now with Darius, um, certainly in any future conflict that will come across, and the southern Greeks um, yet to be directly affected, but certainly they will be very, very conscious of the ever encroaching powers of Darius. You'd be pretty stupid to just think this was nothing to worry about. Darius is grip is getting ever closer to Greece and everyone again is pretty aware that this is largely the Athenians fault they've caused this and after his quick trip around northern Greece subjugating and doing his Mardonius thing um, Mardonius returns back to Persia back to the court of Darius and on his return probably because he's gained new territory partly because he is in some way related to Darius by marriage, he is welcomed back to Persia um, reasonably well. He Certainly nothing bad happens to him, but he is almost kind of relieved of his commands, either as a kind of, mm, well done, but get on the naughty step, or as a kind of, you've had, you have a rest now, you've done quite a bit. It also means that Darius now changes his approach to the Greeks. Obviously, this straightforward campaign has not worked out too well. The northern states are quite troublesome. Um, so Darius takes an approach that is very, very similar to the approach that he used before the Battle of Laid. He thinks, well, if he can't just defeat all the Greeks straight away, let's see how many he can buy off, or if nothing else, intimidate into joining the Persian Empire. So this is where he makes demands of earth and water of all the Greek states. And he sent emissaries and messengers to all Greek states with this demand. The king, de the king of Persia demands earth and water of a sign of your subjugation. The idea being earth and water are essential for your city state to thrive, farming, agriculture and so on. So it's not necessarily, he doesn't have a mud fetish, let's put it that way, he's not really just after some mud, it's symbolic what he wants from the Greeks. He just wants this sign of them say, submitting to him, saying, yep, yeah, fine, cool, we'll be part of the Persian Empire. We're not really that bothered either way. Or we know what would happen if we didn't. Um, and it worked really well in the past, uh, like we saw at the Battle of Laid, where the lesbians turned and turned on the other Ionian rebels because they saw the benefit of staying in the Persian Empire. Oh, and a shed load of cash, let's not forget that. So Darius is hoping this gambit, this gamble of demanding the Greeks join his empire will work. And he seems like he's got good grounds to do this. I mean, he certainly has some notion of just how deep these divisions amongst the Greeks can be. And he's really hoping that he can chance his arm and pull as many to his side as he can. And to be fair to Darius, he's not that wrong. I mean, the Greek responses are at best a mixed response. So Herodotus tells us that the first Greeks to respond to Darius submit. They medize very, very quickly. And this is the island state of Aegina. They are more than happy to join the Persians. So looking at the map, you'll see that Aegina is a small island state just south of Athens. And this is the real reason why they Medes. They're not particularly fans of the Persians or bothered about the Persians. The issue here is that they hate Athens. Athens and Aegina compete over the same waters for shipping, for trade, for fishing, for 
whatever. They are very close geographically, which usually, as always in Greece, makes them at odds politically. Athens keep accusing Aegina of being pirates. The Aegeans accuse Athens of bullying them and taking liberties. So anyone who will help them in their ongoing quarrel with Athens is a friend of theirs. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The Aegeans obviously realise that Athens is who Darius is really after. So they see no, they see no downside in submitting to Persia. In direct contrast, though, on the other end of the scale, the Athenians are not falling for this trick of earth and water at all. And it's not really a trick. It is an honest request. But the Athenians, or certainly the Athenian leadership, know quite clearly that they would not get off lightly with submitting to Persia. Um, Darius is still furious with them. It's unlikely that Athens would be able to retain its democratic government under the Persian under Persian control. So the leaders in Athens would, in whichever way and whichever reason he uses, they wouldn't be around very long. So the Athenian leadership and the Athenians then as the messenger arrives, demands earth and water, uh, they throw him into this pit that's reserved for criminals and effectively kill him. So that's a clear no from Athens. Similarly, um, very similar treatment, when the Persian messengers reach Sparta, uh, the messenger is kicked down a well and he's told he'll find lots of earth and water down there. Again, killing the messenger, a clear no from Sparta. Now, this clear note from Sparta is not because they have a deep-rooted alliance or bond with Athens. It's quite the opposite. They are not fans of Athens at all. But the problem with sending a message to Sparta is the Spartans are incredibly stubborn. And they're also incredibly confident of their own abilities militarily. Don't forget, they are the hegemon of the Peloponnesian League. They are arguably the most powerful military force in Greece, they are these legendary warriors, and they do not play well with others. So yeah, poor old messenger, straight down the well, dead, dead, dead. Now this is really problematic because a really important concept in ancient Greek culture is this idea of xenia. It's this idea of hosting, um, and it's seen as very, very key to the Greeks and the ancient world in that messengers from enemy states should go unharmed. In fact, any guest from anywhere should go unharmed. The, possibly one of the worst things you could do as a Greek is betray this trust of Xenia and murder someone while you invite them round for dinner. It's very key to Greek diplomacy that Xenia um, exists. It's something that forms a huge part of one of the themes of Homer's Odyssey. It's almost kind of sacrosanct so kicking messengers and murdering messengers is really seems quite bad um and even without this concept though you can obviously tell darius is not going to be too pleased that his messengers have been kicked down a well or murdered so we've got two very clear polar opposites in terms of responses to darius at this time on one hand you've got the people in Aegina openly, willingly submitting to Darius to serve their own ends. On the other hand, you've got Athens, Sparta, and all of Sparta's allies, we should point out, all of the Peloponnesian League, now firmly pitting themselves against the Persians. As for the rest of the Greeks, it's not very clear where they stand. Um, many of the states were told, respond, just very non-committally. Argos is a really good example of this. They don't necessarily respond straight away. They say, that's nice, we'll think about it. They're clearly waiting to see what happens. They're being quite non-committal. The idea probably being that um, if the Persians don't do anything, then they're not going to be subjected to Persian rule. But if the Persians do turn up at the doorstep, they can say, Oh yeah, no, we've just got your earth and water here. We didn't know if, should we deliver it? Are you coming for it? Or it's your classic kind of, oh, the checks in the post response. They are very, very non-committal. They're waiting to see who else does what and how they could probably use this to their advantage. 
The other thing we should bear in mind is that not all city-states have clear views on this. Um, some people within city-states would obviously favour joining the Persians, certainly kind of merchants, it would be a massive benefit to them, um, although you'd have to pay extra taxes, but it would open up new trade routes and new protections. Sim on the other hand, though, you've got people like radical Democrats who would balk out the idea of ru being ruled by a king again, and they want to maintain as much independence and democracy as they can. Like I said, Argos typically do not necessarily respond in any committal way, although to be fair to Argos, they are currently busy trying, having just had a bit of a scrap with Sparta. So a lot of the Greek states, it's fair to say that whilst this is a, an impending threat or an impending decision that needs making, a lot of them aren't in any rush to make a decision. They've got enough going on themselves that they want to sort out first. They've not really done much to anger Darius. That's clearly just the Athenians, Eretrians, and now Sparta. So they're dragging their heels. So if we sum everything up very, very quickly, and this has only been a short little dip into how things have changed, the emphasis on changing relations, we can definitely see that the Ionian Revolt has now brought Darius into conflict with Greece, if not direct conflict with southern Greece, but the Greeks are firmly on his radar. This is where he's going to expand next. Again, whether the Ionian Revolt is the sole cause, as Herodotus likes to say it would be, or whether this is just the catalyst, it's very difficult to tell. Certainly, if we look at the history of Persian kings, Darius would be quite keen to expand his empire and Greece would be a natural choice given his failure to expand elsewhere but the Ionian revolt has just moved his timetable up quite significantly and now again we see the eye of Darius's rage is now expanding it's not just remember the Athenians anymore he's clearly because of how Mardonius has got on thought well this how hard can it be to attack the Greeks I'm Darius the Great, I've got a massive army, let's go and get them. Athens still very much the eye of his rage, but Sparta not far behind. He will not take kindly to booting his messengers down a well and doing them in. And also at this time we see this clear division in Greece. With the expansion of Persian territory across the north, Darius has expanded. He's got new footholds in the north of Greece, which would make it easy to launch any further attack on the south of Greece. But at this point, he's effectively split the Greek world in two, geographically and to some extent politically. It's split north to south. The north is now part of the Persian Empire. The south is not, apart from Aegina, obviously, and states like it. But it's also split the Greek world politically because you've got clear fav those who clearly favour Persian rule for whatever reason, like Aegina, and those who clearly stand against them. And much as they try and be non-committal and non not involved, at some point the other Greek states are going to have to do something. They are going to have to pick a side. So there you go, a very, very quick overview look at what happened between the changing relationships between Darius and the Greeks, but also the Greeks and the other Greeks as a result of the Ionian revolt which now acts as a stepping stone for what we need to look at and what changes for the rest of the century. Thank you for listening. I hope this has been useful and not too tedious. Leave a comment below and until next time, goodbye.